lost me. The church isn't a building. The church is the people who have made Jesus the leader of their lives. And that's us. We don't go to church. We are the church. And we exist for the world. Oh, okay. I still don't get it. Let's look in the book of Acts. That's where the Bible talks about the very first church, the people who first believed in Jesus. They didn't have buildings to meet in, so they met where they could, usually in people's homes. So their church was a house? Nope, the church met in houses. Even then, the church was the people. And the apostles taught them many things about God. They did great and wonderful things with God's power. God did amazing things through everyone in the church. Through all the people? How? The people of early church put others first. They prayed together, they shared meals, they shared their time, they shared everything. Everything? Really? Are you sure? Sure, I'm sure. The Bible tells us that when one of them needed something, others shared what they had. They even sold things and used the money to help out. That's amazing. That's putting others first. The early church was really good at it. For instance, this one guy, Joseph, sold a field and brought the money to the people of the church to help those who needed it. Awesome! What made them do that? They all agreed. They all wanted to live like Jesus, and the apostles told them how Jesus put others first when he died on the cross and went up to heaven. The early church learned about Jesus and lived like him, so they put others first. I think I get it. Great! But you haven't heard the best part. When others saw how those first church people lived, it made them want to follow Jesus too. In fact, more people decided to follow Jesus every single day. Wow, God did do amazing things through the first church people. And God still does amazing things through his people when they live like Jesus and put others first. Right, because we are the church. And we exist for the world. The church is the building. Hallelujah. Lord, we just give you glory and praise. We magnify you. We thank you, God, for who you are, your goodness, your grace. We thank you, Lord, for your voice, for the word you have for us this morning. We open up our hearts to hear from you. We ask that you would speak to us, that you would, Lord, reveal to us your will for today. And we understand, God, that because of your voice, we will always... Be confident, because we know that you can tell us what to do in every situation. At no point do we have to be confused, do we have to lose sight of what's ahead of us. But Lord, we know that you have given us a word, a fresh word from heaven. And we trust you, God, to speak to us and reveal to us who you are. We thank you, Lord, for... Speaking, Lord, continuously. Speaking, God, in our hearts and revealing yourself to us. And we ask you just to touch us, Lord, with revelation and wisdom as we get into this, today's message. We give you glory, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. So we thank God for his word, for bringing us here today for another service. It's been it's been some ride the last couple months, I would say. They've been special, but they've been exciting. God has been ministering to us, speaking to us, revealing His will to us. We've been hearing God's voice. We know that we're on the cutting edge of what God has been saying. Uh, uh, about two weeks ago, we had a workshop here on preparing for recession. And... Yesterday, my copy of Fortune magazine came, and the cover of the magazine says, The end is near. I opened it up to read this morning, and I see they're saying, Look out. In the 2019 2020, this economy that we are in, that's doing really successful right now, is going to crash. And there's going to be a recession. And a lot of people are going to be affected. God spoke to us before that even came out. He's been telling us that for over a year. He's been telling us to get ready, get ready. We've been telling people, 
When he brought out the book, the fish with a coin in his mouth, it was in there. We've been telling people to get ready. Hopefully somebody listened. Because now it's game time. So let's get into today's message. How the church grows, a new season, a new plan. Worshipping together at church. Somebody say worshipping together at church. That is the word for today. We will grow together. Somebody say we'll grow together. We will grow together. Ephesians 4 verse 16. Ephesians 4 verse 16. Let's read this together after 3, 2, 3. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. As each part does its own special work, it helps the other parts grow. So that the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. 2018 is our year of individual and corporate growth. This can only happen when each person does his or her own special work. None of us can grow alone as individuals, and none of us alone can grow this church. We need to grow together. Somebody say we need to grow together. We need to grow together. I'll tell you this. God's word is solid. Rock solid. If you do what God says, God will do what he says. I can't talk for everybody else, but I know. Each of us who have chosen to submit to this word that God has released have been seeing growth in our lives. God has been growing us. He's been developing us. He's been taking us from where we were to a different level. 2018, we have grown personally. So we can say that word works in our lives. And God has given us this word for everybody so that everybody else will get to participate. And if you choose to submit to this word and receive this word, you can grow also. Because the word in itself has the power to bring itself to pass. God says that when I release a word, it doesn't return unto me for it. It accomplishes that for which I send it. And he was like, I'm sending this word out. Those who choose to take it, those who choose to be good soil, will see a harvest. And I'm telling you, I choose to be good soil. If you choose to be good soil, raise your hand. I choose to be good soil. How the church grows. Acts 2, 42 to 47. God gave us this word, Acts 2, 42 to 47, in the book of Acts, to help guide and direct us as we continue to, to take steps within the church. Acts 2, 42 to 47. Let's read this together. How the church grows after 3, 2 or 3. All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship and to sharing in meals, including the Lord's Supper, and to prayer. A deep sense of awe came over them all, and the apostles performed many miraculous signs and wonders. And all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. They worshipped together at the temple each day. That's what today is all about. Let's read that. They worshipped together at the temple each day. Met in homes for the Lord's Supper and shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. So they went to church how many times a week? Seven. I know we want to be like the Acts church, but let's, start, let's at least get the one day in. They worship together at the temple each what? Day. They went to church every day when the church started. That was intense, I must say. For some of us, it's a lot to ask somebody to come to church twice a week. That's plenty. Every day. You know, sometimes we want the same results, but we can't pay the same price. You know, we, we're not doing every day. We already know that. So we can't be asking for what they get. Because they went in seven days a week. They were in church. Next level. We're just asking to be consistent. Ten things we got out of this. About how the church grows. Let's go through these ten things. What's number one? Devotion to the word of God that's taught. Number two, fellowship with one another. Number three, communion. Number four, prayer. Five, the presence of the Lord. Six, the power of the Lord, signs and wonders. Seven, sharing with each other. Eight, worshiping together at church. That's what today is all about. Nine, living life together outside of church. Ten, winning the loss. The scripture says, worshiping together at church is one of the things that the early church did consistently seven days a week. We just trying to do one day. But they were doing seven days like it was nothing. Just wake up, let's just go to the temple. They just be in church. Worshipping together at church. Somebody say worshipping together at church. Worshipping together at church. Let's get into this word. One long Sunday service. One long Sunday service. Let's talk about a Sunday service that was really long. 
I mean, I know my dad and Uncle Vernon and them, they, they set the record for long services. But they can't touch Paul. Check this out. Acts 20, verses 7 to 12, New Living Translation. Acts 20, 7 to 12, New Living Translation. Let's read it together. On the first day of the week, which is Sunday, we gathered with the local believers to share in the Lord's Supper. Paul was preaching to them, and since he was leaving the next day, he kept talking until midnight. The upstairs room where we met was lighted with many flickering lamps. As Paul spoke on and on, a young man named Eutychus, sitting on the windowsill, became very drowsy. Finally, he fell sound asleep and dropped three stories to his death below. Paul went down, bent over him, and took him into his arms. Don't worry, he said. He's alive. Then they all went back upstairs, shared the Lord's Supper, and ate together. Paul continued talking to them until dawn, and then he left. Meanwhile, the young man was taken home alive and well, and everyone was greatly relieved. Somebody say one long Sunday service. He said the first day of the week, they went to church. Church went to midnight. Young man fell out the window because he was sleepy. Paul went down there, pick him up, bring him back upstairs, and they continue the service till dawn. Slap on another six hours. And you realize how they did church. They actually gathered for the Lord's Supper, and that's when Paul preached. So they would actually sit down, eat, preach. They went back upstairs, went back up, they eat some more, preach. And that was their thing. They would just fellowship, preach. And Paul preached. The scripture is very clear. And Paul spoke on and on. I mean, it was very direct. It's like the man preached and it was very, very long. And Eutychus, he struggled. He struggled. You know how some people be struggling in church? 20 minutes in and they, whew, Struggling. 30 minutes in. 45. They didn't try to hold it. This man went hours and hours and hours, and this young man couldn't take it. I mean, I can't blame the man. It was long. You know what I'm saying? It went past midnight. He was struggling. And all Paul did was go down, pick him up, and you think the church was, service was over. Well, a young man just died, time to end the service. That's not a sign. You, don't, you think that's a sign? That's a sign from heaven to end the service, no? As a sign, we go raise it from the dead, come back upstairs, and get back along with what we were doing. Because the man was leaving. They valued Paul so much. They valued the word of God that was in his mouth so much that everybody wanted to sit at his feet until he had to leave. They were like, give us everything you have. Because if you read earlier in Acts 20, he was just passing through. He came from another city, heading to another city. He stopped by them. And they knew when he's done, he's gone. You don't know when next you're going to see him. And they were like, if it's going to take us all night to get everything that Paul has in his heart for us, they were willing to sit down and receive. Uh-huh. <laughs> How many of us value the word so much that we're willing to sit down an extra 20 minutes? This is 20 minutes. He may ask him to do plenty. You know, it's usually, you usually get a 30 minute message, you get 50 this week. You can take the extra 20 minutes, the extra 25. Do you value the word so much? They went for 12, 18 hours. And everybody was like, You think everybody's going home? And if somebody fall dead in the service, we could just come back and continue. Especially if it was a long service. Folks would be like, Well, that's my cue. Huh? Some of us get church late and leave early. They went. Because they valued the word of God. And they valued each other. They were having communion with each other. They all stayed together. They wanted to be together. There's something special about them where they really valued the the, the word. They valued the person bringing the word. They valued the people sitting together, listening to the word, fellowshipping together. That they would stay. And they wouldn't grumble. And they would just sit down and participate. Now, I wouldn't lie, if you keep the food flowing, it makes it a lot easier, which they did. They de- definitely kept the food flowing. Let's not sleep on that. One Sunday, Paul preached so long that a young man sitting in the third floor window fell asleep and felt his death. God raised him up, they shared some food, and returned to the service. Many modern Christians fantasize about life in the early church, yet some still struggle to show up consistently each Sunday. And if they do, struggle to stay awake 
during a two to three hour service. Yeah. Let's just be honest. Let's just be honest. I've been in church a long time. Folks be grumbling after they go after two and a half, three hours. Like, oh gosh, they, how long you expect us to be here? Well, how long you thought Paul was going to do this? You wouldn't survive in those days. The early church would have struggled. Because all they did was, whatever it took to get the word, they did it. They were like, I need this word, and the Lord has anointed Paul, and I want to sit here at his feet and get everything he has, because I don't know when I'm going to see him again, or if I'll ever see him again. They valued him, and they valued the word, and they valued each other. Everybody gets that? Somebody said one long Sunday service. That's not this Sunday, so thank God. So don't worry about it. I'm not going to talk till midnight. We're going to be all right. In his presence together. Somebody say, in his presence together. together. We should want to be in his presence together. Hello. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Let's be in his presence together. Hebrews 10, 19 to 25. Let's read it together after three, two, three. And so, dear brothers and sisters, we can boldly enter heaven's most holy place because of the blood of Jesus. By his death, Jesus opened a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. And since we have a great high priest who rules over God's house, let us go right into the presence of God with sincere hearts, fully trusting him. For our guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean, and our bodies have been washed with pure water. Let us hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. God can be trusted to keep his promise. Let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together, as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. So I'm looking at this scripture about neglecting our meeting together. Let us not do that. And I realize if you really go back into the story, you're like, man, this is part of a list of things that the Apostle Paul is is enlightening us concerning, encouraging us to do. Because of what Jesus did. It's more than just, let's just not neglect being together. No, it's because of what Jesus did. So he starts off with brothers and sisters. Because of the blood of Jesus, we can enter the most holy place. Because of the death of Jesus, there's a new and life-giving way through the curtain into the most holy place. He's like, because of what Jesus did, you can come into God's presence. You can come into God's holy place. Why is this important? Because this is the context from which he says, hence, because of what Jesus did, because he gave us access, because of the miracle of salvation, the miracle of the blood of Jesus, let's not neglect coming together. Let's not neglect coming into his presence. Let's not neglect worshiping together because of what Jesus did. The price he paid for us to get a chance yeah. to come together and worship. Let's not neglect it and take it for granted. Look at what he had to go through yeah. for us to get a chance to sit together and worship God in ease. Because yes. until Jesus died, we had absolutely no access to the most holy place. Right. Absolutely no access. He said, I can tell you without question what Jesus did gave us access. He said, come boldly into the most holy place. Amen. He opened a new and life given away by his death. Watch the connection. He said, let's go right into the presence of God. With sincere hearts, fully trusting him. Because of what Jesus did. Because of the blood of Jesus. Because he died on the cross. For guilty consciences have been sprinkled with Christ's blood to make us clean. Because he's made us clean and pure. Because he's washed our conscience. We can come to church. We can come into his presence boldly. And our bodies have been washed with pure water. We've been forgiven. We've been cleansed. We've been purified. Let's hold tightly without wavering to the hope we affirm. Why? Because of what Jesus did. Because of the blood of Jesus. For God can be trusted to keep his promise. Why? Because of what Jesus did. Because of the blood of Jesus. Amen. Then, let us think of ways to motivate one another to acts of love and good works. Because of what Jesus did. Because of the blood of Jesus. And, let us not neglect our meeting together. Not for the fun of it, because of the blood of Jesus. Because we can come boldly to the throne of grace. Let's not neglect our meeting together, as some people do. Because some people do. Some people still do. It's 2018 and they're still doing it. They were doing it then, do it now. Nobody understands why. It's 2,000 years and people do the same thing. People be people. Let's just keep it real, you know? Well, it's a new generation. Things are different. Ah, uh, yes and no. People doing the same stuff. 
still neglecting beating together. You think we'd get it by now. But encourage one another. Especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. And obviously we know the day of his return is nearer now than it was then, right? At least we're 2,000 years closer to the day of his return. It's been a long time. Everybody guess that? Yeah. Somebody say in his presence together. In his presence. Do you see the context within which the scripture says, don't neglect meeting together? He does say don't neglect meeting together for the fun of it. No, don't neglect meeting together because of the price Jesus paid for us to be able to meet together, for us to be able to enter his presence, for us to be able to have access, for us to go into the Holy of Holies. He's like, hey, they open the veil. Now let's all go in. Yeah. Not they open the veil so you can stand back. He's like, you finally get a chance. Now go in. Don't neglect the ability, the opportunity, the access that Jesus' blood gave us to worship together, to enter into his presence together. Because he's coming back. Somebody say coming back. coming back. He coming back. Jesus shed his blood so that we could have direct access to the presence of God together. We can trust him. Our consciences have been cleansed. Our bodies washed pure. And we must never give up hope in his promises. Therefore, we must motivate one another to do what is right. And we must not neglect meeting together. Meeting together is part of the package. It comes with encouraging one another. It comes with accepting what Jesus did on the cross. It comes with entering into the presence of God. It's a package deal. You don't just show up to church for showing up to church. You show up to church and... You encourage one another and you trust in God and you don't neglect the hope of the promise that he's given you and you remember what Jesus did on the cross and you take access into his presence because of the blood of Jesus and come boldly. It's a package deal. It's not random. Well, I don't know if I'm going to go to church because I'm the church. Great, I get it, I get it. Amazing. But look at the Bible. Read the book. Why gather together? Somebody say, why gather together? Why? I mean, I'm the church. I can just be home and just be church. True, yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. Matthew 18, 18 to 20. Let's read it together after 3, 2, 3. I tell you the truth. Whatever you forbid on earth will be forbidden in heaven. And whatever you permit on earth will be permitted in heaven. I, all, I also tell you this. If two of you agree here on earth concerning anything you ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. For where two or three gather together as my followers, I am there among them. Look at the connection. He said, I've given you authority to forbid on earth things that will be forbidden in heaven. To permit on earth things that will, that will be permitted in heaven. And he said, I also tell you this. With that authority I've given you, if two or three of you gather together, combine that authority, and agree on earth concerning anything, you may ask, my Father in heaven will do it for you. And... The same two or three of you who have that same authority to bind things on earth and they be bound in heaven, loose things on earth and they loose in heaven. Two or three of you gather together with that authority. I am there among you. That's why God told us every time we come in this place, he's coming here. Every time we come in this place, he's coming here. You want to see God operate? You want to see God manifest himself? Show up. I know we like magical things. I know we like stuff deep. How about if God says, all you need to do is show up and a prince of the Lord will be somewhere? Who will be willing to pay that price? That's an easy price. Because sometimes, sometimes you think, well, no, we've got to sing this song or we've got to dance or we've got to whatever. Yes, 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 yes. But in this scripture, he's saying, all I need you to do is show up and I'll be there. You get a bunch of Christians full of the Holy Ghost, faithful, hungry, to just show up in a place, God's just going to be there. You'd have to work up God to show up. I'm going to work it up, work it up so you'll show up. No, he's already here. Hello. You could stir up the Holy Ghost that's already inside of you. Let God's presence manifest in a special way. But believe you me, you show up, he shows up. Somebody say, you show up, show up. he'll show up. One more time, you show up, he'll show up. One more time, you show up, he'll show up. God has given us authority to use the name of Jesus on the earth and impact things taking place in the spirit realm. When we talk about the heavens, we don't just mean in the sky, the spirit realm, eternity. That authority is enhanced when we join together in agreement. Who likes enhanced authority? 
I like to win, and, but I also like to win big. He promises to show up any time we gather together in his name. Why gather together? To experience a special dimension of his power and presence. Why gather together? To experience a special dimension of his power and presence. God is like, look, people, I've given you authority with the name of Jesus to impact things taking place in the spirit realm. We can speak things and we can change what's going on in the spirit realm. Things we can't see or touch or feel. And sometimes things we don't even know. That authority is enhanced when we join together in agreement. There's something special about when a couple of people who all believe the same thing come in agreement concerning that thing coming to pass. He promises to show up anytime we gather together in his name. He's like, I want to be there. He's, I can't just have a bunch of Christians hanging out and I don't show up. God is like, don't leave me out of the party. If, I, if you're there, i there. Hello. Why gather together? To experience a special dimension of his power and presence. Let's say it together. Why gather together? To experience a special dimension of his power and presence. Somebody said, Jesus set the tone. You want an example? Jesus is that example. He set the tone. You know, some people be like, I know you're saying all this stuff, but what did Jesus do? I agree. I agree. What the WDJD, what did Jesus do? I get it. What did he do? I mean, I, I, know, I know Paul and the early church, they went to church. That's what the scripture said. The first day of the week, they had an extra long Sunday service, and that's when the young man fell through the roof, well, fell through the window. But did Jesus go to church too? I mean, what, did he go to his version of church? Let's see. Because they went to church every day, the early church. Were they following Jesus' example or did they make it up? Luke 21, 37 to 38. Luke 21, 37 to 38. Let's read it together. After 3, 2, 3. Every day, Jesus went to the temple to teach. And each evening, he returned to spend the night on the Mount of Olives. The crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him. So how many days a week he went to the temple? How many days a week did they go to church together? So the example Jesus set was every morning he went to the temple to teach. And people were like, well, if he's going to be in the temple teaching, where do you think we're going to be every morning? The crowds gathered at the temple early each morning to hear him. You know, people talk about, well, I mean, man, I would love to walk with Jesus, walk where he walked, talk where he talked, etc. Cool. If he was here and he was in church every, every morning, would you come? If every morning Jesus was here, right here teaching, would you come? Or would you be like, well, all right, I can make it on like a Sunday and maybe one other day of the week because I have things to do. If Jesus was, hey, if Jesus, who thinks the people here did not have things to do? I mean, I'm just asking. Do you think these people here did not have things to do? Do you think they had families and jobs and a life? They have things to do, right? But somehow they made it to hear Jesus preach. They have things to do. Well, you know, we have stuff to do. I don't know how you can expect us to be in church. I don't know how Jesus is expecting them to be in the temple. But they showed up. And then when Jesus died, rose, and went to heaven, and the apostles showed up, people showed up in church every day too. At some point, it dropped off. I don't know when. Sometime between the Bible and our days, it dropped off. And now, we had a bag here to come once a week. There's power in people coming together consistently to worship God, to hear God's voice, and for God to hear their voice. Jesus set the tone for church attendance. Not only did he show up every morning to teach at the temple, people showed up each day to hear him. We follow his example by going to church each Sunday morning. As our first fruit offering for the week. I mean, we, we, we're not on this level. We're not even on the level of the early church. But at least, we say, once a week, set the tone. Give, 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 a, give a first fruit. Give an offering. Give a sample. One day a week. Somebody say, Jesus set the tone. I'm going to close it off with how Jesus intended it. What was the intention of Jesus for the church to work? How did he expect this thing to work? 
What did he intend? I know sometimes you'd be like, well, you know, I'm the church and I'm just going to be myself and I'm going to be all right and I'm just, just going to be me and Jesus and my Bible and Christian TV. Mm -hmm. Yes, I know. What was Jesus' intention? How did he set things up? How did he structure the body of Christ? Let's read this together. Ephesians 4, 11 and 15. Ephesians 4, 11 and 15. Let's read it together after 3, 2 or 3. Okay. Now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work and build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord, measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ. Then we will no longer be immature like children. We won't be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. Instead, we will speak the truth in love, growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. This is what Jesus really intended. He started a church, he was like, look, when I leave, because if you read before verses 11 and 15 in Ephesians 4, it talks about he ascended. First he descended, then he ascended, and he gave gifts to men. These are the gifts that he gave as he went back to heaven. Apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. He said, I want some structure, and I'm going to assign certain people to certain functions. I'm going to give them anointings and gifts to operate in those functions. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do His work. So for God's people to do God's work, they have to be equipped. And for them to be equipped, they need these five anointings. And build up the church. For people to be built up, they need to be a part of this package deal. He said, if these are in place based on the gifts that God has released, this will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that we will be mature in the Lord. This is how God expects Christians to grow up. You are equipped as a part of the body of Christ as a part of the church, and God puts people in your life to do the equipping. Yes, you're going to do the work, but you have to be equipped to do the work. I went to engineering school, now I do the engineering, but my engineering professor doesn't do engineering. They just teach us how to do engineering, and we go out and we do it. We have to be equipped. In the same way, for you to go do what God called you to do, you can't just do it by yourself. A lot of people think they're living their purpose by themselves. You're not. You can't. It's impossible. You have to live your purpose within the context of the body of Christ. You fit into the part that God has for you. Is that my finger saying, I'm doing my thing, I'm doing my own thing? Yes and no. You can do your own thing, but you've got to be connected. Somebody say you've got to be connected. Because if you're not connected, you're looking crazy. And God is like, each person connected, each person in their own place, and God has assigned the fivefold ministry gifts to equip each person. And he said, if you all are where you're supposed to be, it will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son. Now, we will be mature. He said, we'll be unified and we'll know Jesus and it will help us to mature. Measuring up to the full and complete standard of Christ, live up to Jesus' standard. And you know Jesus' standard is way high. Let's not sleep. Then, we will no longer be immature like children. So obviously, there's some immaturity that exists without the ministry of the fivefold, without the structure of the church, without being equipped. And when you're not equipped, you can be tossed and blown about by every wind of new teaching. And believe you me, there's always something fresh. Thank God, I don't know it all now. I'm happy. But back in the day, I used to know all the new stuff that's coming out. I don't know anymore. I'm sure there's some fresh that just came out in the last six months. That's to tell you how far behind I am and what's the hottest new doctrine. I don't know. I'm out of touch with all that stuff right now. But I know people know it. Because there's always something fresh. There's always something hot. And the people are always flying all over the place with it. Flying everywhere. As every wind of doctrine, as they blow, they're flying. And God is like, hey, get within the body of Christ. Get within that structure. And I'm going to help you be solid. And not be thrown all over the place. You understand? He said, you'll not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever they sound like the truth. 
And they're they out there trying. They're trying hard. Instead, we will speak the truth in love. Growing in every way more and more like Christ, who is the head of his body, the church. Jesus Christ put the structure of the church together so that his people would mature and grow spiritually until we are one in him. We don't worship together in church just because we want to. We do it because that's how Jesus intended it. Why do we worship? Jesus Christ put the structure of the church together so that his people would mature and grow spiritually until we are one in him. We don't worship together in church just because we want to. We do it because that's how Jesus intended it. Let's stand on our feet. Worshiping together at church. Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Thank you for revelation. Thank you for revealing your will to us and speaking to our hearts. Teach us, God, to worship together at church. Give us wisdom. Consider how to, to create that community of believers who worship and who serve you together as one. Send the people that you have called to be with us, to worship with us. The people whose hearts are knit with ours. That you want to be a part of this family and this community. You know who you want us to, to worship together with. And we pray God that you will send them from the east, the west, the north and the south. We believe that you can do anything. You've given us this place. You've given us this space. You've given us the resources to, to finance this. You've given us all that we need that it will be sustainable. And we ask that you send the people that you want to be a part of this community. We give you the glory. We give you the honor. In Jesus' name. Amen. Even right now, the offering bucket passing around. You can go ahead and sow into today's word. Whatever it is that the Lord has blessed you with. He's been good to us. We know that this is good ground. And every seed that's sown will come back with a bountiful harvest. And we praise God for that. Lord, we thank you for every seed that was sown in the offering today. We pray that you'll multiply every seed that's been sown. And that each of us that will have household prosperity in this place. There'll be no lack. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, so let's get through today's offering. Today's announcements. Quick offering announcements. All, everything, just get through it. Announcements. Sunday morning, 10 a.m. We're here every Sunday. 10 a.m. and there's always room for you so come through all right we got extra chairs if we use up all the chairs we just grab more chairs out and fit in the hallway Sunday morning prayer 10 to 11 be here or be square prayer was amazing this morning thanks Pastor Angel for participating in this and, and bringing bringing the fire Chairman's ministry returns September 2018 next month we look forward to Sister Gabby coming back and finishing the next semester of college and Terrence Ministry come back. Yeah, that will be awesome. So what's on the calendar? All future conversations, we're going to start back in September. The first Thursday in September, we will return to call for shop conversations. They got testimony or prayer requests. The Body Church INC at gmail.com. Send it to us. The Body Church INC at gmail.com. And this month's Decatur Community Workshop is going to be on Improving your credit. We're going to get the flyers up and start marketing this week. Ask the body. Do you have a question and need an answer from the Bible? Email us at bodychurchinc at gmail.com or put it in the box. We got it. If you're going to give online, there's a donate button on our website. Easy as ever. One click, that's it. You can donate from anywhere in the world. Now you're your first time visitor. You can get a welcome card. Submit that into the offering so we have the ability to connect with you. If you want to join the Body Church family, are you looking for a loving church family and are interested in joining the Body Church? Please see an Astro for a brochure. Ministry opportunities. We have opportunities, and if you want to do something in church, you can find something to do. You don't have to be bored in this place. It's going to be great. Missions and Outreach. These are the ministries that we support, and we thank God for the opportunity to 
to always connect with them and the good things that they're doing. Praise God for that. Every first Sunday we have communion. Today was the first Sunday and we had communion. So we praise God for that. And it's always a, a joy when we get to introduce new members on this Sunday. So let's look forward to next month. Visit our website, thebodychurchinc.org. You will see the latest series and you'll be able to participate. Everything that we do here, it's on video. You'll be able to find it. And you want to find us on Facebook. It's pretty easy, The Body Church, INC. And that is it. Let us pray. Lord, we thank you for your presence, your goodness, your grace, your faithfulness. We ask you, God, to guide us home. Let us be the best week we've ever had in our lives. Show us favor this week. Give us direction this week. Prosper us this week. So you'll be glorified in all that's done. We rest in you. And we're thankful for your faithfulness and your love. In Jesus' name we pray. We thank for your angels going with us. You give them charge over us to keep us in all of our ways. They lift us up as we dash our feet against a stone. We thank you, God, that you know, as we travel this week, God, you guide us and you surround us with your protective angels. And bring us home smoothly, God. And we declare that everything that we set our hands to do this week will prosper and will be even more successful than we imagine. Because your presence is with us and your wisdom is released on us. And it gets a week of favor and good news and breakthrough and open doors. In Jesus' name we pray and everybody says, Amen.